Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to essentially CSAC's last seminar of this quarter, since this is finals week for undergrads. Uh, I'm Cameron Tracy. I'm a research scholar here at CSAC, and I'm happy to be introducing today Thomas McDonald. Uh, Dr. McDonald is a fellow in the Nuclear Policy Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And befitting CSAC's uh, expertise, he has a mixed technical and nuclear policy background. Uh, he works on arms control, nonproliferation issues, uh, using especially probabilistic methods for uh, innovation in the arms control space. He has a PhD in nuclear engineering from MIT, uh, as well as degrees in pharmaceutical sciences and biochemistry. So uh, without taking up any other time, let's go to Dr. McDonald to learn about tracking mobile missiles from space. Great. Um, thank you. And thank everyone for attending uh, in person. I know it's uh, last <laughs> towards the, uh, the end of the year. So I'm glad um, you guys all came out in person and uh, everyone online for joining as well. And thank you to CSAC and uh, Cameron for hosting me. Um, so this work uh, originally started um, in my graduate studies uh, at MIT, um, and more recently I got some support from the Stan Foundation to basically turn this into a more policy-oriented, uh, policy-usable kind of paper. So that's sort of the, uh, the angle that I'll be, I've been taking with it. So just for the sake of making, making it uh, clear where I'm approaching this from, I just want to make some explicit some of the background and underlying assumptions that I'm going to be working from. Uh, first is that deterrence is, you know, conceived of, conceived of as a way to avoid nuclear war, and it rests on mutual vulnerability, which itself uh, relies on countries having a survivable second strike capability, uh, and that undermining that survivability of nuclear weapons uh, can create first strike incentives, which can drive crisis instability in arms racing. Of course, survivability is not automatic, and states rely on hardening, redundancy, and concealment to secure their forces. And each of these methods is subject to technical and operational co competition where the defender develops ways to keep their forces safe and the attacker develops ways to hold those forces at risk. So in the security studies literature, there's this cottage industry that I count myself uh, a part of, uh, creating analysis on whether X or Y technological trend uh, might undermine survivability and therefore deterrence. Um, this work uh, focuses on a particular section of that debate. So it's the competition between remote sensing technologies and survivability through concealment, specifically the competition between remote sensing uh, satellites and ground-based mobile missiles. Um, and I'm focusing on ground-based mobile missiles for a few reasons. Uh, first is that for any counterforce attack to be successful, uh, it must attack ground-based mobile missiles in concert with uh, bombers and silos and subs, et cetera. Uh, two, they are probably the most survivable part of the Chinese and potentially the Russian nuclear arsenals. Uh, and three, remote sensing technologies, uh, which are in competition with the survivability of these weapons, have been undergoing a very public and very visible uh, development over the past few years, which has really driven a lot of interest uh, in the topic. So it's not to say that the fate of nuclear deterrence hangs specifically on the outcome of this competition, but it is an important part. So another way to think about it is this is a necessary but not sufficient component of counterforce. So the ground-based mobile missiles that I'm talking about um, are those carried on transporter erector launcher vehicles, which I'll just be calling TELS for short. Um, they're a significant portion of both the Russian and Chinese arsenals um, operating out of uh, these bases. Um, and they're also used by North Korea, India, and Pakistan. Um, as mobile targets to be attacked, the attacker must first know their location. So such an attacker would need to track those targets over time. Um, but once they do locate them, they are relatively soft targets, uh, at least in nuclear attack. Um, conventional attack would require a degree of timeliness and accuracy in tracking above and beyond what is needed for a nuclear attack. So um, for this analysis, I'm just considering uh, nuclear counterforce against these ground mobile missiles. So there is uh, a narrative in the literature that advancing counterforce and supporting technologies will make uh, tracking feasible in the near or medium term uh, and will do so in uh, an inexorable or inevitable manner. Um, there's a th stronger thread of the same argument that asserts that you know, any and all concealment will become technologically impossible in the coming decades, um, even for more advanced states. But I'm going to engage mostly with the, the first thread. Uh, 
Um, the specific concern in the case of ground mobile missiles is the continuous advances in remote sensing, uh, signal processing, and artificial intelligence, intelligence technologies um, that will make it extremely difficult or impossible for less technologically advanced states to conceal the location of their mobile nuclear forces. Um, there's a major, largely unexamined tacit assumption underpinning this narrative that I've identified, and that is um, that tracking ability once gained is robust and tells either can't or won't be operated in a way that evades tracking. Um, in my opinion, this assumption has persisted because we don't have a comprehensive imagining or conception of what tracking actually entails. And we often conflate detection with tracking. So we assume that if we can detect something with a sensor, if we can see it with a sensor, that means we can track it. Um, so we end up in this sort of analytical mindset where we're just enumerating different uh, tracking or detection technologies uh, without elaborating on how they would actually fit together in order to track something as a system. So an analogy, if we want to think of it, of tracking as a game, we know the players, which would be what I'll call the hider and the seeker, so the tracker and the, the hider. Um, the, we know the goal of the game, which is to deter or have damage limitation capability respectively, and we know the pieces of the game, which are the tells, the roads, and the sensors, but we don't necessarily know the rules. And without the rules, we can't develop an understanding of the strategies that each player would pursue and how those strategies would interact, um, which leads to this assumption of non-evasive tell operation and an overestimation of the robustness of tracking. Um, so this work has sought to delve into what it means to track something. Um, and rather than approach it from a technology first mindset, uh, approach it from the other way by analyzing the problem as what do you have to do to track a tell? Um, and then seeing how different technologies that we know about might fit into that framework. And to preview my main thesis, uh, tracking tells is much more difficult than is appreciated. Um, it requires significant investment to gain tracking capability in the first place, and that capability is also fragile. The hider can decisively interfere with tracking with a number of technologies at a number of different price points and levels of commitment. So before we start talking about technologies, let's define uh, tr what tracking is, how it works, and then I'll raise four main points that I think are underappreciated in the literature. Um, a simple definition of tracking is to know where something is or know the location of something over time. And in the case of tracking tells, um, let's cast it as a game with two actors, uh, a hider who has some number of nuclear arm tells that is trying to keep safe and a seeker that is trying to find those tells. So consider a tell on patrol that is sitting on a road and the um, dot here represents the last place a tell was detected and the black lines uh, would be the roads. The seeker, looking for the tell, observes the road where the tell is and detects it. So it has learned the location of the tell. However, observations with remote sensors are discrete events in time. Um, if there were only one tell in the world, perhaps a seeker could simply use um, a whole slew of sensors to just stare at that one tell continuously. Um, but in practice, there will be multiple tells, all of which, which need to be tracked. And satellites, um, which house a lot of these sensors, are constantly in motion. So sensors will be going in and out of range over time. So your observations or opportunity to observe a tell are going to happen sporadically and periodically. And since tells are mobile, between observations, the seeker needs to account for the fact that the tell can move. So the seeker can constrain their belief about a tell's position to an area around where the tell was last seen, uh, indicated by the blue. Um, the size of which will depend on how far the tell could have moved since it was last observed. So um, after an observation, some time passes, the possible locations of the tell spread out, and then the seeker goes to make another observation. And there's two possible outcomes here. One is that the uh, seeker detects the tell again, in which case it can narrow down its belief about the, tar the tell's location to the new detection uh, location. Um, and in the other case, there is no detection and the seeker is unable to narrow down their um, belief about the possible location of the tell. And now as a second, uh, between the second misdetection and the next detection, there'll be further time where that tell can move and specifically can move from any of the locations where it could have been um, based on the seeker's belief to encompass uh, any number of uh, further regions. So the seeker's obvious response would be to increase the rate at which observations are made. Uh, 
by adding a lot of sensors. And at a high enough uh, cadence of observation, uh, a tell would not have an opportunity to move a significant distance, so it should remain tracked uh, in between observations. Um, there are two observations assumptions that I want to make uh, explicit here. Uh, one is that sensor coverage is irregular. Even with perfectly symmetrical satellite constellations, the Earth's rotation in a regular distribution of roads and terrain will mean that sensor environment is going to change over time. And two, um, tells can hide, either that uh, be that in a shelter, something like an overpass, a garage, um, up to something like a hardened bunker, or with some sort of deployed camouflage netting uh, mesh in the case of radar, as, as we'll come to. So the competition can be modeled as one where the tells are largely in hiding, and I'll explore this more in a second, um, to avoid detection and will sporadically have opportunities to move without being detected, say from a gap in a, in a satellite coverage. Um, with evasive tell operation, the seeker will not be uh, regularly detecting the tells that it is tracking. So the tells goal, or I guess best strategy here is to avoid detection at all costs and have an opportunity to move um, whenever these uh, say gaps in coverage arise and exploit that. Um, an important point here is that where the tell actually is in this case is, is secondary. Um, what matters is where it could be um, as long as it remains uh, undetected because the uh, hider has, or the seeker, sorry, has to account for all of the possible locations where the tell can move. So for the seeker to destroy the, this tell, um, they need to commit a number of weapons to cover all the possible locations that the tell would be, plus somehow account for um, the locations where the tell could move during the delivery of weapons. Basically, this is a barrage attack against a mobile target. So it needs to have enough um, weapons effects coverage of where the tell could have been at the time the attack was launched, plus count for however long it takes to deliver those weapons, which will be on the in the range of say seven to eleven minutes for depressed trajectory sub-launch ballistic missiles, up to about thirty minutes for ICBM range missiles, um, and it needs to account for all of that by barraging the entire area. Um, so to define what constitutes uh, good enough for tracking, uh, we have to define it in the context of a counterforce attack. Whether the seeker knows uh, the location of the tell sufficiently well that the seeker feels confident in its ability to conduct a counterforce attack against the hider's mobile missile force. So this brings me to the first point that I think is often overlooked in the current debate. If the seeker wants to destroy all of uh, hider's tells without giving them an opportunity to retaliate, and it may settle for less than this, less than you know, all of the hiders tells an extremist, but it's going to aspire to get all of them. Um, this means that the counterforce strike needs to be highly synchronized and nearly simultaneous. Uh, the ramifications for tracking are that the seeker needs to track all of the hiders tells at the same time, and it needs to do so in advance of a counterforce attack, as it can't necessarily um, count on being able to find tells in the midst of a crisis. Um, this also means that the seeker cannot pick off individual tells as the locations become known, um, and that the seeker must attack all of the hider's tells uh, at once, including those which, which are well hidden. So tracking um, is not defined at the level of a single tell. You can't say this tell is tracked, this tell is not tracked. You say the force is tracked or the force is not tracked, because you may know the location of one tell very well, but it might be offset by one that is very well hidden. Um, the second issue is that the hider controls when to move its tells and when to keep them hidden. So the hider will not parade its tells around to be detected. Uh, it will hide most of the time and choose to move tells only when the tracking system is least capable. So to put it in more concrete terms, let's say you have a bunch of tracking satellites in orbit, um, such that 90% of the time you'll have a satellite overhead of where a given tell operates. If that tell moves, you shouldn't expect to have a 90% chance of detecting it. You should expect to have a 0% chance of detecting it because that tell is not going to move when there's a satellite overhead. It's going to move in the, whole, in the gaps between them. So if a hider is operating evasively, the seeker's uncertainty is going to grow with every uh, gap in coverage. The third related issue is that since the seeker, or sorry, the tells can hide, if a tell becomes you know, lost to the seeker, 
the hider, um, if it can identify this, can keep that tell hidden, possibly for the entire um, time scale of a crisis. So the seeker, if the seeker has significant gaps in their tracking system, the hider can exploit these, then go into hiding and force the seeker to only rely on indirect detection mechanisms, uh, methods to try and find those tells. For example, trying to figure out if a tell is in a shelter based on patterns of life around that shelter, rather than directly observing a tell. Um, and the downside of these sort of indirect detection mechanisms is they're very easily spoofed. It's very, um, you don't need it. Uh, to have a tell to make it look like there's a tell in a location. So they're just, it's a much less reliable detection mechanism than direct detection. And I'll return to that uh, in a moment. Um, but the ramification of that is that tracking needs to occur continuously and it needs to happen well in advance of any crisis. Um, and finally, the hider should be expected to take countermeasures. And the decisiveness of those countermeasures has not been fully appreciated in the literature. Since tracking fails at its weakest point, uh, countermeasure does not need to comprehensively overcome a sensor system. It just needs to create a gap that a tell can exploit by moving in that gap and then going into hiding um, in order to cause the seeker's uncertainty to grow. So to go to back to the example, if the seeker uh, had built a satellite constellation sufficiently dense that they had a satellite overhead 100% of the time, countermeasures don't need to defeat 100% of the satellites to defeat tracking, just the five or 10% or whatever that is needed to create an opportunity to move without detection. Okay, so what does that, um, so what can we say about tracking today using this framework? So I'm not gonna go through every single one here. I'm just gonna, for the sake of time, uh, jump to sort of the more um, relevant tracking systems. So these are all, remote sensing technologies that have been raised in the literature as uh, weighing in on this, this competition. So um, I'll just jump to the two at the bottom because I think they're the most relevant. Uh, first is optical imaging. So this is spanning optical through hyperspectral imaging and it's probably the most uh, prolific space-based sensor. Under the right conditions, optical systems do or can do everything required uh, for tracking against a permissive hider. It can detect and identify tells that it can see. Um, and keep track of those over time. The downfall of optical systems is that they cannot operate at night or when it is cloudy, um, which can be a significant portion of the time. Um, these conditions create gaps, which TELS can use to move without fear of detection. And again, to reemphasize the TELS don't actually have to move, the seeker's uncertainty will just grow at the possibility of movement. So even with a massively dense optical system, you're gonna have effectively zero tracking capability um, against an evasive hider because the hider can just generate sufficient uncertainty to deter probably over the course of a couple hours while it is cloudy or at night, uh, and then send their tails into hiding and lock in those advantages. Um, and there's some indication that this is what Russia does today with how it um, patrols its tails. Um, and that will bring us the, I'll just jump to the, the last one here, which is uh, space-based radar. So um, radar uses uh, radio waves, which do not depend on the sun and can penetrate through cloud covers. Um, and there's some technical detail that I'm largely gonna skip over here, but I'm happy to talk more about later. Um, but suffice to say that uh, radar systems have the technical capability to both detect and identify tells using a combination of different radar measurements. Um, this does impart some minimum technical capabilities on radars for them to be useful in the role, but um, probably don't need to get into that here. So there, basically there's a, a set of different radar modalities but using a combination of surface moving target indication, which is SMTI, synthetic aperture radar, and inverse synthetic aperture radar, um, space-based radar can uh, identify and track uh, tells in basically any, any situation where they can see them and can do so through clouds and at night. So uh, because it can operate um, through clouds and at night, it doesn't have any conditions-based gaps um, and so it is simply a matter of just throwing enough radar sensors at the problem in order to be able to, to gain tracking capability against a permissive hider. Um, the seeker doesn't necessarily need to get exactly continuous coverage where there is one or more satellites in view every single second, but they do need to close the gap sufficiently that the opportunities for tells to move become infrequent relative to the timescale of tracking. 
um, which is going to be the endurance of how long a tower can stay on patrol. Um, unfortunately for the seeker, radar relies on line of sight, which means uh, there needs to be an unbroken line between the radar sensor and the tail itself. So anything like a hill or a tree can sight block a radar observation. Um, the more dense a sight block, the sight blocking environment is, so if you're in a forest and there's a lot of trees close to the road, the more sensors you're going to need in order to overcome it. Um, so the takeaway point here is that uh, space-based radar is both capable and critical to tracking um, as it is of these basically the only system that can operate continuously whatever the, the conditions are and that is a, it's a requisite for closing these gaps um, and when I say it is capable uh, I mean with enough satellites and permissive hider radar has all the requisite tools to track tells and when I say it is critical, um, I mean that is difficult to envision a, an effective tracking system that does not rely on space-based radar to track hiding tells at night and when it's cloudy. Um, and these gaps, if not filled, could fatally undermine tracking, um, as there would be repeated and predictable gaps that the hider could exploit to grow the seeker's uncertainty and unlock that uncertainty in by hiding. Um, this does rests on the assumption that sufficient progress is made in automated target recognition and other what you might call AI methods for processing just the sheer volume of data that you're going to get out of the number of sensors you would need. Um, but there's no you know physical basis for saying that that's impossible. So is uh, an assumption that I'm, I'm just going to make. Um, and today we have about one to two dozen space-based radar satellites in orbit, um, but half of those are belong to the US. Um, and so if you assumed that all of those um, were tasked with tracking tells, you would get something like at the latitude of North Korea or the northern part of the Chinese bases, something like 22 minutes gaps between every single satellite um, overflight. So um, basically you'd have 22 minutes for the tells to drive around willy nilly and there'd be five minutes or so where there's a satellite over the head where they'd have to hide and then another 22 minute gap. And anyone who's ever driven a car knows how far you can get in 22 minutes. So you can just kind of stack that high, you know, move that distance, hide, move that distance again, hide. Um, and so the, the seeker's uncertainty is just going to grow and grow and grow almost continuously. Okay, so um, let's assume that a country invests a large, in a large uh, space based radar constellation designed to track tells. Um, so basically going from the 20 ish we have now to something like 50 or 60 and that's where you get to the point where the, the gaps in between are getting relatively small. Um, so if say the US were to build up to say 50 or 60 uh, space based radar space based radars. Um, what might we expect as a response from the hider. Um, you know these S, uh, radar systems would be critical to maintain tracking. So any ability to punch a hole in the radar coverage will also punch a hole and crack in the tracking if it's done at night or if there's clouds overhead. Um, so countermeasures really need to uh, be included in the discussion of radar tracking as radar basically would form a single point of failure into a, into a tracking endeavor. Um, so I'll, I'll group them into two uh, countermeasures into two categories, those which interfere with sensors and those which interfere with tracking. Um, so interfering with sensors would be something like anti-satellite weapons uh, or radar jamming. Um, radar jamming, um, so this is a, a Russian radar jammer. Um, basically, it just broadcasts white noise into the sensor and makes it difficult for the sensor to look into look around the radar or the jammer rather. Um, modern radar systems, you can't jam from the side, so it doesn't. You can't you know disable a satellite that you see way off in the distance. But what you can do is prevent it from looking at the jammer. So basically, you would force it to stare into the sun uh, if it wants to look near that. So it basically creates a little blind spot in radar coverage that could be used to provide you know cover for um, tells to move around. And if you put that on a mobile system, if it can operate the jammer while it's moving, then you can sort of move this blind spot around and create a basically a, a little path that the tells could take to move in between shelters, move between hiding places, or just you know the possibility of those happening. Uh, Anti-satellite weapons um, is simply just a matter of removing sensors. 
um, from orbit. Uh, obviously, something that'd be very provocative, and so not necessarily something you would see happening preemptively, but in a scenario where a nuclear crisis is growing out of a conventional conflict or war, you might see satellites being removed uh, for just conventional warfighting um, re rationale or reasons um, during the conventional war. So you might get to a point where your tracking constellation, which is has some capability against tells, is starting to get degraded just because, say, China or Russia doesn't want the US to have those capabilities to track, say, uh, conventional tank units and whatnot. Um, the second set of uh, countermeasures that I want to talk about were the those which interfere with tracking, but not necessarily with um, sensors themselves. So these would be things like decoys or covered roads. So decoys are basically anything made to look like a tell that you can ideally you want to be able to drive them around. Um, that basically confuse the um, seekers uh, tracking <laughs> methodology and basically just add new targets to that they need to, to take care of. Um, and if you have ones that can be built um, to be lightweight or you know collapsible, you can do things like move a fake decoy to a shelter and then just leave it there. And it'll it just undermines the seeker's competence in their ability to, to or in all of the um, observations they've made up to that point. Um, and you basically will get into an arms race where you're trying to build enough decoys to make them difficult to attack with weapons. Um, and it's just a number. You could do it as a way where it's a numbers game between building a bunch of decoys so that you just have too many targets to be attacked. Um, the second, which is kind of more specific to space space radar, would be covered roads. So um, the wavelengths of light that uh, radar systems use get reflected by um, meshes, metal meshes that are that have a a mesh size that is um, about one and a half centimeters, about this big. So the same way that uh, on the front of a microwave, there's a, a little mesh that you can see through, but that keeps all the microwaves in, in, the, in the microwave itself, um, whereas visible light can get through. So the same exact same principle applies to radar, it's just the, the mesh size is a bit different. So if you had something like a relatively fine chain link um, fence, you could drape it over a road, um, something like that. I think this is a foot tunnel over here, but you know, that communicates the right idea. Um, and then radar systems basically would not be able to look in, would not be able to look through that mesh. And so it'd basically just be opaque to radar. radar. Um, you'd also probably want to put something like a camouflage netting or something to also make it opaque to, to optical sensors. Um, but basically then you can make routes or basically above ground tunnels that are um, areas where once a tell gets into them, it's, it's basically impossible for the sensors to tell where within that system it is. Um, but unlike tunnels where there's the weakness of you just destroy the entrances to the tunnel, if you have something like this, the tell crew can just cut out the sides, try, and provided that the tells are able to go off-road and launch from um, those under those conditions, then it, it basically lets you build relatively inexpensive tunnels um, that don't have the, the downside of tunnels. Okay, so for the sake of time, I believe I'll skip through and just go to my conclusions. So, um, so the conclusions uh, from this are first and foremost that tracking is relatively fragile. So anytime there is a gap in tracking coverage, whether these are from conditions, so this would be you know nighttime or weather, um, or gaps that are created by the hider through use of countermeasures, this can cause this uh, seeker's uncertainty to grow. And if these gaps um, are created repeatedly, then the seeker's uncertainty will diffuse and um, the seeker will lose track of tells uh, relatively quickly and have little ability to relearn the locations of those tells over the course of the crisis. Um, second is that space-based radar would be critical to tracking tells um, and has all of the capabilities uh, necessary to track tells of a permissive hider um, built into it. Um, and it just becomes a matter of throwing sufficient numbers of radars at the problem to, to gain tracking capability. However, uh, tells can be operated in a way to both increase the costs of implementing such a tracking system um, by operating in, say, forested areas where you'll need more sensors. And then after 
or before even in the case, especially in the case of radar jammers, which are already deployed today, countermeasure, countermeasures could then be used to defeat a system, uh, a tracking system once it is depleted. So building off of these, uh, my ultimate conclusion is that the erosion of survivability of TELS is not inevitable and the, uh, it is subject of a you know, vigorous competition, but one that I think favors the higher. Thank you. Thanks, Thomas. Uh, if you want to have a seat at the front, we can move to Q&A. Uh, because we do have a large number of our attendees online, I want to remind everyone that we, uh, through the Q&A function on Zoom, can easily incorporate questions from you. If you simply enter them there, uh, I will relate them to Dr. McDonald uh, so we can make sure you're engaged in the discussion. And I really encourage uh, any of you guys who do have questions to feel free to enter them there. But we'll otherwise start with questions in the room. Uh, so do we have any first questions here? Hello, yeah. uh, hi, I'm Robert Cassard. I'm a... uh, if you could wait for the mic, please. I'm Robert Cassard. I'm a visiting scholar at the Gordian Knot Center. Uh, when we talk about the um, countermeasures that are available, whether it's the jamming uh, vehicles, or the above ground tunnels with the uh, chain link fences. Obviously we see the jammers are an actual thing. Or is there any um, proliferation of actual above ground tunnels or anything seen yet? Not, not that I'm aware of. Um, certainly there's use of below ground tunnels, um, but they haven't necessarily, um, I, at least I, I haven't seen any of the, the above ground tunnel. It was just a, um, sort of the product of a brainstorming <laughs> exercise for when I'm trying to try. The way I approached the, the, the problem was figuring out, okay, what do you have to do if you have a bunch of radars to track something? And then you do the next step, which was, okay, how do I break that? Um, and when we're talking about countries like North Korea, which are relatively resource constrained, some of the low tech um, countermeasures are a little more appealing in that way. Um, so as, as I mentioned today at, you know, at best there's, you know, radar coverage 22 minutes out of every 27 minutes. Um, and those, that's under some fairly favorable assumptions for the, the radar operator. So I don't think you really need to get into these big capital intensive ways to defeat tracking right now. You just have to you know, have some sense of where these satellites are and then just hide for those five minutes. And you know, it's something that needs to be practiced, but um, it's free in a way, whereas building something like an above ground tunnel takes resources to build. So it's something that you, I would, I wouldn't expect to see it built until there's already a bunch of radar systems in orbit or going to be soon. Um, it's, it's more of a, a possible response than a, a thing that's already there. Whereas the radar, and the radar jammers that are there out today are not specifically aimed at space-based radar. They have, there's some reports that they have been jamming US SAR satellites, but they're also part of air defenses and whatnot. So it's, they're, they're out there for other reasons, not necessarily in response to this. Scott and then Harold. Hi, I'm Scott Sagan, the co-director here. Um, I want you to broaden out a bit. Um, the Chinese are reported to have um, developed ICBM silos, not just TELS. And there have even been some reports that the North Koreans may be developing a silo as well. And that suggests to me that either they disagree with you or there's some synergistic capabilities that is uh, an ICBM silo might be less vulnerable to a conventional attack and TEL might be more. Can you, can you talk about that issue? Sure. And if I can jump in there, uh, this is related to one of the questions online from Tracy Wilson. So just to follow on to this, she asks about data fusion of multiple sensor modalities, optical, radar, so on. Uh, and also uh, related to that about how the use of AI and machine learning to analyze patterns of life data of tell movements uh, could play into this use of multiple sensors alongside that other information you might have from long-term observation and uh, large data analysis. Sure. Um, so in terms of silos, um, at least in the Chinese case, my assumption uh, is that they're, they built a, clearly quite a large number of silos. Um, 
potentially more than they can fill with missiles, at least in the near term. So um, my guess is that they're going for something more like the MX system, where it's a, it's a bit of a shell game um, between these hardened silos um, and basically building a warhead sponge, essentially. Um, I could see how having not being fully reliant on tells has uh, some attractiveness just in terms of having redundancy in case you know I, I am wrong or they don't you know don't believe my analysis that um, if they do feel that their tells are vulnerable they have something else to, to back up on um, in terms of the conventional vulnerability of tells it, I think that's only so in the nuclear counterforce case, you have one weapon that can cover something like a few kilometers of area and destroy tell relatively well. Um, with a conventional system, you kind of need to know pinpoint exactly where that tell is. So you need to be able to do tracking, to do uh, conventional counterforce against tells, you need to already be able to do this nuclear, nuclear counterforce against tells. So that is certainly, a, it's a thing I've, I've heard brought up, but it's, it's also a, um, sort of point of vulnerability, I think is maybe a little overblown, but I'm, I, you know, I, I'm happy to defer to, to folks who know a little more on that front. Um, moving to a uh, question from online, in terms of data fusion from multiple to LEs. So um, yeah, one of the, the ideas um, that I was grappling with is sort of what can the different types of modalities add to tracking? Um, so what I ended up settling on is this idea of gaps, where if, if you have a time when there is little to no sensor coverage, then the tell can kind of just do whatever it wants and you have no real recourse. So when you have say optical sensors plus radar plus everything else, um, it's not just a matter of, oh, I've got a bunch of different sensors. What does each sensor add? Um, and radar seems to be the only one that operates at night and through clouds and over kind of wide areas. So it's kind of adds a unique capability and it's a unique capability um, for periods of time, like nighttime is a significant part of the day and it's cloudy, uh, especially in a place like North Korea, like hundreds of days a year. So um, you might have all these other, you know, awesome optical systems, but they're only providing coverage under a pretty narrow set of conditions and they're not necessarily contributing to closing gaps. So even if you have all these sensors, um, they're, they're kind of redundant with capability you already have. So um, why I focus on radar is because it has that sort of critical technology. It's like a single point of failure where if, if you can beat radar, you beat tracking because it doesn't matter what's happening during the day or when it's clear out if, if you can beat radar and then operate under clouds, essentially. Um, in terms of the patterns of life um, and AI, it's, yeah, it's certainly a, a thing I've uh, heard brought up um, a bit. Uh, basically, it does come down to another situation where you're not trying to track tells per se, you're trying to figure out the locations where tells tend to be, and then just attacking those specific locations. So, you know, looking at I don't know if this underpass gets during training gets used a lot by tells, so we'll just attack that that underpass. Um, which all of that sort of relies on the assumption that the pre-crisis behavior is going to be carried out after the crisis, um, which is just slightly too fragile an assumption for me um, for a nuclear counterforce attack. Because if you're committing to a counterforce attack, you're committing to nuclear war, or at least responding. Um, and so I would assume you would want to track the tells and know where they are as best you can, rather than just look at areas where they might be and hope you get them all. But it is, it is definitely a, a, something I've, I've heard brought up, and especially in sort of in the midst of a nuclear exchange as a, as a different thing. But I think that's a slightly different problem than necessarily what I'm talking about. Great, um, interesting talk. Thanks, thanks uh, for being here. Um, so you mostly focus on sort of breaking the 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 seekers chain at the sensor, spoofing the sensor, you know, avoiding detection, hiding. Have you looked at the information processing uh, side of it? Because I think part of these arguments rely not just on ubiquitous sensors, but the ability of using sort of machine learning techniques to correctly process the information um, and 
maybe doesn't apply in the case of radar, but certainly in the, sort of the optical, you know, facial recognition or object recognition, uh, it's been shown that you can relatively easily spoof the AI so it doesn't see the actual object that it was asked to detect just by, you know, altering the, the optics. Is, is that something that could be done in, in sort of the, the radar dimension? Thanks. Um, yeah, so, so mostly I, I did focus on the, the sensor part because basically it doesn't matter how fancy your, your processing is if you don't have good, good information from your sensors. Um, but yeah, so, so one of the sort of assumptions that I, I put in here was that um, I'm assuming that the automated target recognition stuff just works um, and you would need that for, for tracking just because if you've got you know 60 satellites all producing basically a continuous stream of data this stuff all needs to get processed in real time you really don't have a person in a loop except for maybe as like a back like a fact checking kind of role um, so yeah it would all need to be optimi uh, automated rather um, and as you mentioned you know there's there's some some work out there about I believe it's called the antagonistic um, Injection. Basically, you mess with the training by making small changes to. Um, yeah, yeah. Because like with radar system, or um, if you're talking about radar or uh, trying to spoof radar, there are things you can change that will not look particularly um, drastic from an optical sense, but from a radar sense, completely change the shape and the, of the, the return you would get from it because it, it, the wavelengths are just sufficiently different that it just behaves completely unintuitively from our eyes. So you put a, a little re corner reflector somewhere in a, in a tell, um, it's gonna look very different to a radar, even though to the eye, it just looks like a tell with a radar. <laughs> so yeah, there, there's certainly ways to go about breaking that. It's, it's just a little outside of my, my expertise. Uh, online question from David Elliott, who asks about uh, whether you might use something like weight detection to discriminate decoys from actual tells. And to broaden that question, uh, just if you were a, a dedicated seeker and you knew that the adversary was using a large number of decoys, are there any other signatures you might look at that might be uh, particularly attractive for that discrimination? Yeah, that's um, so. I guess the issue is just how do you, what sensor do you use and how do you get it there? So there are certain things like um, unattended ground sensors that, if you put it near a road, um, probably just from the sort of acoustic signature of the engine of the tell going by, you could probably use that to discriminate between a tell and a decoy. Um, I'm not sure if if you can do weight detection remotely. Um, nothing's jumping to mind, but that doesn't necessarily um, strike me as well, I don't know. Um, but yeah, so basically the, the issue, especially when it comes to Russia and China, is where these tells operate. They're very um, internal to the country. They're far away from the coasts. And so it's, it's difficult to get certain sensor types there. So any things that need to be in place covertly, such as those are the unattended ground sensors and the tra um, target uh, tracking beacons. Um, or anything based on uh, like an airframe, a drone or a plane are just difficult to get to where you need them to be. Um, and again, because you need to have this really long baseline, long-term tracking coverage, a lot of these sensors that um, are sensor types that might have good, might provide you with useful information. Um, it's just difficult to envision how you're gonna get it there and keep it there. So it's a very reliable um, source of data. Yeah. Um, which is why I hadn't I hadn't considered um, or I hadn't put too much stock on on those, um, but yeah. So basically, if you're um, trying to discriminate decoys, uh, basically, I guess if you want to think about it from the other way, if you're trying to make your decoys look like your tells, you should also do anti-simulation to make your tells look like your decoys, um, and you can kind of shape the outside of tells using um, either like hard metal cabinets um, or something like, again, like a mesh mesh wiring or something with some um, camouflage in it or something um, to chain, to make your tells look more like your decoys. And from there, it would probably be something along the line of weight and um, sort of like the agility of the, <laughs> the vehicle because I, presumably your tell is, you know, it's a big heavy object that doesn't turn very well. It's, it's pretty slow. Um, so from the hiders 
perspective, they're going to try to make everything look as close as they can. Um, I guess one thing I have seen is um, using synthetic aperture radar uh, interferometry to look for tracks in like the dust on roads, um, which presumably would be more prevalent for heavier systems. Um, but those are one kind of easy to spoof because you can just drive something heavy nearby and it'll, it'll reduce the utility of those measurements. And also I think there are, um, have been, I think I've seen something with Russian um, security vehicles having like a, it's almost like a salt dispenser from, from road trucks on the back that just sprinkles dirt behind them to fill in the, <laughs> so there, you know, there, there is, there's ways around it. There's a lot of kind of cut and thrust of uh, what sensor are they using right now? How do we defeat it? Um, but yeah, it, it, I think it's a, you can kind of get down some this move, next move kind of rabbit holes on this. Yeah. Great. Uh, another question from online, Ted Rabb from uh, the Carnegie Science uh, Center here at Stanford asks about uh, the use of these chain link fence tunnels. Uh, so with real Faraday cages, you haven't applied voltage to those. So he asks uh, whether you would need or want something similar on this case or whether grounding on the earth is enough. It's a good question. Um, I'm not sure. It, uh, that's maybe a little outside of my, <laughs> uh, my expertise. I, I, don't know, I don't think you necessarily need, strictly speaking, a Faraday cage. You just need something that's going to be opaque um, to view through from the radar from a, from a relatively sharp angle. Um, so. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if you would need more than just grounding or uh, grounding to the ground. But good question, actually. And from uh, Frank O'Donnell, so he asks: in, in the scenario you were talking about, where you have gaps in in coverage, and the uh, hider can take advantage of those to move during the gaps, wait for them, so on. Uh, are you assuming in your analysis that the hider knows when those gaps are occurring? And if so, how would they uh, keep apprised of, of when they're being essentially watched and when they have uh, opportunities to, to move yeah, undetected? That's a really good question. Um, so yeah, I, I am assuming that the one of two things, either the gaps are long enough and prevalent enough that they don't necessarily need to know all of them, which I would argue is maybe the case today when it's cloudy and at night, that there's just so few radar satellites that you don't necessarily need to to know where all of them are, but you just need to move enough tells and you'll probably have a few go missing essentially. Um, but when you get into the higher density coverage things, um, you know, more satellites in orbit, then yes, I'm assuming that the, the hider has some capability to track where the radar satellites are um, in their orbits, either through um, space domain awareness, awareness capabilities, um, which you know, Russia and China both have to keep track of where the satellites are, what their orbits are going to be, which you can then use to predict where they're going to be in the future. Um, and then you'd probably need some way to broadcast that out to the tells to update them with if there's any changes in orbits and whatnot. Um, and when it comes to radar specifically, um, you know, radar works by blasting an area with radio waves. And so you can detect that um, at the point of the, the, the tell. Um, so the tells can actually, if you know what frequencies to look at, um, the tell might be able to detect when it's been observed or if the area around it has been observed. It doesn't actually need to be on a tell, it could just be on, you know, near the roads. So there are ways for the seeker, or sorry, the hider to know where the uh, seeker's radars have been looking. Um, but mostly it would come down to space domain awareness and just knowing where the satellites are um, and assuming that they're not going to be frequently and aggressively maneuvering in space because it's very fuel um, costly for fuel and which decreases the lifetime of the satellites. And when it comes to, you know, big radar satellites, which are expensive, you don't want to be degrading their, their lifetime that, that much. I have a question. Um, this all seems pretty ripe for quantification. You know, you'd have to make some assumptions about the, the sensors mounted on them, on these satellites and what their spatial and temporal resolution and so on is. But it seems like with some reasonable assessments, you could start making models of uh, optimal tell operation, things like this, to minimize uh, time moved while being tracked or while being detected, this sort of thing. Is that part of the work you're doing or something you might do in the future? Uh, it's something I did in the past. <laughs> um, so my PhD work was very technically oriented. There was a lot of modeling. Um, and while I thought that was fine, I thought it, it it's just spent a little too much time 
building this model that has a ton of moving pieces because there's a lot of things you need to assume like how how far a tail can move between hiding places and how fast a tail can move and how the roads are going to be oriented relative to the satellite flight path. So there's just a lot of assumptions and they're all fair assumptions, but it's just a lot of assumptions. Um, and out of that work, I thought there were some qualitative aspects that were in themselves useful. And so that's why I, what I was focusing on with this work is um, trying to just bring those the qualitative aspects to the fore because I, I thought anytime you do modeling, you know, to get the model to work, you kind of need to pull it off of reality a little bit. Um, and for a big complicated problem like this, did you just get pulled further and further away? So I'm just a little hesitant to go too deep into the, too deep, go back to the modeling, I guess. But I take it at least with semi-reasonable assumptions, your, your findings on the quantitative side kind of support your conclusions here that there appear to be feasible, effective ways of hiding. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, it, it kind of comes down to just knowing the knowing that you're trying to either move during the gaps or create gaps and then um, how many satellites there are kind of dictates where you are in that spectrum of can you just move evasively or do you have to resort to countermeasures? Uh, Amit Mathur asks about whether Pakistan has its own tells or whether they're using tells of Chinese uh, provenance. Not sure. Uh, I, yeah, I, I don't know enough about the region. Um, to say for sure. Then uh, another question from Tracy Wilson, a follow-up to, to Scott's question. Um, they ask uh, that since the US has superior space-based sensor capabilities versus Russia uh, and China, but has eschewed the use of mobile missiles, uh, then lacking sensor coverage would suggest that it would be easier for the US to avoid detection of mobile missiles if it had them. Uh, is that because the U.S. has chosen to rely on SLBMs for survivable second strike, or is there another reason there? Um, sorry, can, can I think it's basically uh, so? If this is the case, if this analysis makes sense, and if Russia and China don't have space-based assets that could reliably track tells, mm -hmm. why is the U.S. not using them if they would be so effective for maintaining survivability of uh, nuclear forces? Yeah, so I, I'm not 100% sure on all of the bureaucratic drivers for why the U.S. missile force looks the way it does today. Um, I would agree that if the U.S. fielded mobile missiles today, they would probably be quite survivable. Um, I don't know if the U.S. force structure is how it is because of, you know, necessarily clear um, data-driven uh, decisions at every point, so I'm not sure. I know there is at least some thing of a, a group of folks within the US um, security establishment who do favor mobile missiles <laughs> and have been advocating for them. Um, but yeah, I, I think the U, in the US view, uh, US SLBMs are just so survivable that it's taken a lot of pressure off of the idea of, of um, survivability and like needing to, to keep up with that competition. Various implementations of, of mobile missiles were part of this whole MX uh, debate or debacle, whatever you want to call it, over how those would be based, uh, ranging from traditional tells to essentially a, a big race course, a circular course that they would just travel around, I don't know, constantly or intermittently. In the seaplanes. Yeah. And uh, yeah, no, there's plenty in there. Is there a question in the back? Did, yeah, yeah. Hey, Ian Reynolds, uh, fellow here at CSAC and also the Institute for Human Centered AI. Um, I just kind of wanted to give you the opportunity to reflect on some of the more concrete policy implications of this, as you mentioned that this is kind of the direction that you're hoping to take this project. Um, would you then, I think it's pretty clear, suggest that like cool it on your attempts to add more and more satellites and more and more sensors because you're just not going to have enough? And is that sort of an effective argument or will there be a lot of pushback? Um, Cause you mentioned this is sort of a built-in assumption in parts of the literature, so thanks. Yeah, so um, I, I think if kind of the most concrete thing is, I guess it's to go off your question, whether it's cooling it on adding new sensors. I don't know if there is um, a huge push at the moment to build a radar system to track tells. Um, it, have been brought up in you know the mid 2000s but it was much more modest system um there is sort of a, a narrative that 
all of the say commercial sensors and all of the sensors that are being built for other purposes might sort of inadvertently give someone tracking capability. Um, I don't think that is true. And I don't think that's necessarily gonna happen because you need to have this very dedicated, very long-term focused tracking, you know, uh, intent essentially. So um, I don't think say um, some of the, uh, I can't remember the, the names of the companies, but there's, there's, you know, a commercial SAR company that's, you know, sells SAR images. I don't think they're going to accidentally track the Russian tel fleet. So I don't think you need to worry about that. Um, and the other sort of thread that, that the work was meant to engage with was um, this idea that survivability is going to be eroded by advancing technologies. So we need to plan for the world where that's gonna be the case and we should just pursue damage limitation. Um, and I don't think damage limitation is necessarily going to be too easy to achieve. Um, so I would say maybe cool it on, on that, that thread. Yeah. We have here a good question to end on. Uh, someone asks where they can find the associated paper or when in this case. Uh, when? Yes, we're, I think, submitting end of July, so hopefully later this year. And we'll see exactly where it comes out, but, um, yeah. Oh, so, um, I'm working with, uh, Charlie Glazer and a couple of folks who he's putting together a, what's essentially a book project on, um, the future of deterrence and damage limitation with advancing technologies. And mine will be, it was originally going to be a, um, book project, but I think now we're submitting as a special issue. So um, it'll either be a paper or a chapter, um, and that should be by the end of this year, I think. Great. Great. Well, I'll look forward to it, and uh, let's thank our speaker. <laughs>